All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on farm and ranch tax strategies for 2023. My name is Sarah Campbell. I'm USDA's beginning farmer and rancher coordinator. Uh, we are bringing this webinar to you as part of USDA's farm tax education and asset protection initiative. Um, there's a whole suite of resources and webinars like this designed to help farmers and ranchers better plan for and understand their ag taxes. You can see all of those materials at farmers.gov taxes. We've partnered with the National Tax Extension Committee uh, to create a webinar as we do them monthly, um, as well as some fact sheets and information. We want to make sure that folks understand the important relationship between USJ program payments and their taxes. So thank you all for joining today. We are here with Bob Ray uh, from the University of Illinois, and I'm going to kick it over to him in a minute, but just a little bit of housekeeping for folks. This is being recorded. Uh, once we finish the webinar, we will go through and caption it and upload it on the farmers.gov YouTube page. We've got a farm tax education playlist on there where you can see past webinars as well. It just takes us a little bit of time to do that captioning and get the recording edited and formatted and online. It takes us one to two weeks usually to do that, kind of depending. So if you don't hear from us immediately after this, that's why. But once that webinar recording is posted on YouTube, we email everyone who registered for the webinar uh, a link to that as well as a PDF copy of the slide. So don't worry, you will be able to access these materials after the fact. It just takes us a little bit of time to process it. And during the webinar, please put any questions that you have in the Q&A box. We're going to do a robust Q&A at the end here. So. With that, I'm going to kick it over to Bob to introduce himself, talk a little bit more about his work, and get going. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob Ray. I serve as Chief Executive Officer of an organization called Illinois FBFM. We provide accounting tax consulting services to farmers all across Illinois. And this is also a part of the University of Illinois Income Tax School. I'm also an instructor for that group, and in that way, I am a part of the National Farm Income Tax Extension Committee, who is the group who brings uh, this information to you today. So good afternoon and welcome uh, to this webinar, Farm and Ranch Tax Strategies for 2023. We'll talk about a lot of things that we'll need to be paying attention to during the coming uh, 10 months as we think about 2023 tax impacts for our farm producers. We are in the middle of uh, preparing tax returns for 2022, of course, and starting to e-file those uh, with the IRS. Our March 1 farmer deadline is just a few days away, closely followed by a March 15th deadline for, for our, all of our partnership S-Corps uh, that have uh, that middle of March filing deadline. But it's a, a rainy, dreary day in central Illinois where I am this afternoon, and we need some much needed rain. We have not had uh, much snowfall during the, this winter. It's been a relatively mild from a temperature standpoint. And it's also basketball postseason, Sarah. So tonight I'm running the clock at uh, two uh, high school basketball games as teams try to survive and advance in the Illinois uh, high school playoff scenario. But let's talk about inflation. And you know we're going to kick off our strategy because this is such a key factor for our farm families in 22 and into 23. This chart is the Social Security cost of living adjustment screen. This goes back a long way into the 70s when I myself uh, was on the high school basketball court uh, playing in the postseason. And look at the inflation that was going on around me at that time. 6%, well, that was a low number. 14% in 1980, my goodness, what a huge number that was. But now go into the time when I was in college and began my career from the uh, early 1990s uh, through 2022 is that where this screen is at. Only a few years in that 30 year time period were we above the 4% mark. You see three years where it was a 0% cost of living adjustment within the past 20 years. And my, what times we have differently today. Uh, just announced last week, the inflation adjustment factor for January of 23, a little over six and a half percent. So what does this mean? 
Well, it affects lots of things. And the first line item on this screen is affected significantly. This is a screen I like to share when I'm dealing with farm clients about what should their AGI actually be uh, based on non-deductible expenses that they've incurred uh, during the year. We use this a lot in tax planning to know, well, what makes sense for my AGI level? We look at their living expenses, non-deductible. We look at their income tax liability. Well, certainly the federal portion of that also non-deductible. We look at principal payments that were greater than the depreciation deduction, also non-deductible. You might also think there about uh, cash used to make down payments on non-deductible purchases like farmland. My example shows that AGI ought to be $130,000 to reflect the amount of non-deductible expenses the farm incurred during that year. And maybe that's where they want to be. Maybe there's a better reason it should be higher or lower than that. But the last line is what I think is important. You know, farm families often strive to manage their tax liability by pushing AGI lower than maybe it should be. And that's just fine, but we need to recognize this key point. When that's done, we're increasing our tax deferral to be taxed in some later year uh, by having carryover grain, prepaid expenses, accelerating depreciation. All of those are fine tax management steps, but it's important we help our families recognize that that tax didn't disappear, it's just being deferred. Well, when I was a high school senior in 1978, the highest marginal tax rate was 70%. That's a really big number. And that means if those families in that tax bracket earned another $1,000, $700 went for a federal income tax obligation, a really big number. Today, the highest tax rate is 37%. We also have this thing called CUBIT, a Qualified Business Income Deduction. And when that uh, family is eligible by being in a trader business, their effective rate is not 37% any longer. It's actually 29.6%. And that's the lowest federal tax rate that I've seen in my nearly 40-year career helping farm families work on income tax planning. This last bullet point also critical for our long-term planning. They can have about $364,000 of income and still be taxed at the 19.2% after the CUBIT application, of course. That's a 24% federal rate times 80%. So that's the highest amount of income that I've ever seen taxed at the lowest rate that we've ever seen. But it doesn't mean our families are paying less tax. I began my career with FBFM in 1984, and the average farm paid $3,800 of tax in Illinois that year. Last year, that number increased at nearly $25,000. So even though our rates had fallen significantly, the pool of income had increased to such a degree that there was still a larger tax liability incurred. Well, here's the 2022 married filing joint federal tax bracket. And I wanna demonstrate the significance of inflation on this key factor, the federal uh, tax rates for married filing joints. So look at the 32% line, if you would, for me. You see $340,100. That's the level when the 32% bracket begins and the 24% bracket ended. On the far right column, you see numbers in red. Those are the effective cubit rates, meaning they're 80% of the number on the left. Now, remember, 340,100 at the 32% level. These are the same tax brackets, but advanced for 2023. And here you see the 32% bracket begins at $364,000, not 340. That's just the result of the inflation impact on federal income tax brackets. This is good news for our farm taxpayers as they can have a little more income in 2023 
still taxed at the 24% or if Cuban applies 19.2% federal rate. So this is one good feature of the inflation effect on income tax planning, higher amounts taxed at lower rates. This is another feature uh, that is important uh, that inflation has affected uh, for our farm taxpayers. These are the married filing joint head of household, unmarried individuals, and married filing separate standard deductions. These change with the Taxpayer Cuts and Jobs Act in, uh, in 2017 that was signed in late December. And instead of having what had been for a long, long time in my career, a married filing joint standard deduction of oh, 10 or $12,000, that tax act raised that significantly and here now we're at 27,700. This means uh, many fewer clients uh, need to worry about itemizing their deductions to record their medical, uh, state and local tax, home mortgage interest, uh, charitable contribution expenses. Instead, they can rely on this larger standard deduction and shelter, again, for Mary Joints, nearly $30,000 of income from any federal income tax. Now this slide has some really interesting data provided. And this is another impact from 2022 that continues into 2023. The change in interest rates that affects the transition cost for a young or beginning farmer to get started in the business of farming by acquiring assets from a retiring farmer. So these are the IRS applicable federal rates. They're published every month, designed for a variety of purposes by the IRS to give all taxpayers a standard amount to use in determining interest rate charges. So notice in the far left in December of 22, the short-term rate for IRS AFRs were 4.55%. And the long-term rate, 4.34%. Well, that's the first interesting point of our slide. The short-term rates higher than the long-term rates. Very rare does this ever happen in the finance world, but it happened the last few months of 22 and still is true in the first few months of 2023. Now, direct your attention to the farther right of the screen. And you'll see in December 21, just 12 months earlier, what those rates had been, only 0.33% short and 1.9% for the longer term interest rates. And you see there that the long-term rates were really six times as much as the short-term rate. And both of them have increased 300 to 400 basis points during that short 12 month period. And what does that mean? Well, let's look at the cost to transfer some equipment over three years. If you're financing that as the buyer, your interest cost went from $1,982 a year ago to over $27,000 at the end of 22. What a difference a year makes in the financing cost. Increases the transition cost for the young and beginning farmer to acquire that machinery equipment asset. Similar result on the farmland. Now this is over a longer period of time, so the impact is not quite so dramatic, but it went from 97,000 a year ago to 229,000 at the end of 22. Again, increasing the cost to the buyer a significant amount due to higher interest rates. But here's the silver lining. So what about the seller? Well, the seller has a lot more interest income coming their way from this transition. And so maybe they can afford to discount the purchase price a little bit, or maybe there's some other benefit they can grant to the young and beginning farmer. But the short answer is the seller has a lot more investment income to consider in their tax planning for the year. I put these interest rates back from 2023. I picked a few selected years uh, back to 2006. And I picked that one because that was also a time where the short-term rates were almost to the level of the long-term rates, but never exceeded them. 
also kind of close in 2018 and 2020, but still the short-term rates never exceeded the long-term rates. And in 2023, in fact, the long-term rates were only 85% of the pure value of the short-term rate. And there you see in 2021, look at that number, 10 times the margin from a long-term rate to a short-term rate. So what will these look like in January of 2024? Well, that's a long time to guess that crystal ball, but it's been such a dramatic shift in the past 12 months. The other impact to our farm and ranch tax planning for 2023 is the effect of inflation on our asset values. And so not only now does my young and beginning farmer have a higher financing cost to acquire the assets, they're probably also buying a higher valued asset. So I took a farm uh, that I was familiar with and in 2020, they had about seven and a half million dollars of assets. I went up only two years to 2022. In Illinois, we've had several land sales above $24,000 an acre, farmer to farmer used for farm ag production purposes. Several sales in the 16 to 20,000 range and so I plugged in 18,000. I increased the value of their crop production from 800 an acre to 1,300 an acre. Think about a 200 bushel of corn in Illinois at a $6.50 corn bushel price. That's $1,300 an acre of gross value. I raised the machinery value 30%. Yes, we've witnessed uh, those asset values rising. And I cut the stock value uh, by about 30%. Again, here we've seen a pretty uh, large decline in non-farm assets, especially stock aggressive stock funds during 22. But what's the bottom line? In 2020, my producer had seven and a half million dollars of assets. And two years later, that had grown to $12 million. So their transition plan now is trying to figure out a $12 million plan, not a $7 million plan. And for our uh, producers who are buying these assets, you know, they've increased their capital requirement uh, nearly 80% to make this happen. So one other Bob? piece, that, yes. Sorry, we've got a couple um, questions uh, that have come in and I'm wondering if you can also just give a little bit of intro and background to um, AGI and some of these tech of these slides here um, and just break yeah. it down for folks who aren't familiar with the concepts and the acronyms. Very good. Very good. Yes. Thank you, Sarah, for jumping in there. So let me uh, describe some of these. So AGI is our acronym for adjusted gross income. So for an income taxpayer, that's a combination of all of their net income for all sources for the year. It's essentially the bottom line on their income tax return. It's also the number that's used often to determine eligibility for uh, FSA program participation and ability to get uh, those type of uh, program payments. And I'll watch the acronyms a little more and try to make sure I highlight those, Sarah. Thank you for that. So now we're talking about different asset groups. And it's important to recognize that farm and ranch taxpayers have at least these four general categories of things that they are selling during the year that generate taxable income. And it's important to note that different types of taxes apply to different types of assets that are sold. So let's work through inventory, for example. So this would be selling uh, market livestock, uh, grain inventory that's produced on the farm, uh, anything that that farmer is using in their trade of business as the things they're buying, uh, as the things they're producing and selling. So they're subject to the highest tax rates, ordinary tax plus this other self-employment tax of 15.3%. So it's the easiest thing to produce, that's what they're in the business of doing, but it's subjected to the highest marginal tax rates. Equipment sales. So think about combines and planters and trucks and tractors and all those 
types of things that they use in their business. And when they trade those in, or when they sell those on the market, that'll generate taxable income. The good news here is it's still subject to the ordinary tax rates of 37% maximum level, but there is no self-employment tax incurred on selling equipment. So a slightly lower rate here than the first category. Buildings, exactly the same as equipment. If they're selling uh, livestock confinement facilities, machine sheds, barns, any type of uh, building used on that farm property, they're gonna be subject to ordinary tax rates, but no self-employment tax. And then here's the one that has the lowest tax rate, this asset group called land. We might also throw in here breeding livestock that you've raised on your own farm operation. These are called capital assets. They get taxed at favorable capital gain tax rates. They can be as low as 0%, for a significant amount of revenue, it's 15% tax rate. And then once incomes exceed a, a $500,000 range, they get taxed at a 20% capital gain rate. So much lower and more favorable capital gain rates apply than do ordinary tax rates on selling equipment, buildings, and inventory. Well, that self-employment tax affects the inventory sales. And for many farm families, it's a significant part of their tax planning and tax liability. So there are a few things that can occur to reduce that self-employment tax and shave their tax bill a little bit. They can make gifts of grain to children, to charities, to other people. And that lowers the self-employment tax by pulling that grain sale out of revenue and instead it's treated as an inventory gift. Pick wages, that means payment in kind wages. And instead of paying employees with a check subject to all types of uh, withholding, many operations can make payments in kind and transfer, for example, a thousand bushels of corn to that employee for the work they've performed for them Employee still has taxable income, but there is no self-employment tax or FICA tax in this case, uh, which is also a similar feature uh, to self-employment tax. The FICA tax is paid by the employee. You can have a machinery trade. This also was new in 2018 for the first time. We're selling equipment. Well, we're not really selling it, are we? We're trading it in but we're required to report it as if we had sold that equipment on a form uh, 4797 as part of the tax return that reports sales of property used in my business. That sale amount does not become subject to any self-employment tax 15.3%. Now, when I've made that trade, I've also purchased the full amount of my replacement equipment. And we're gonna depreciate that amount on my Schedule F and any deductions on Schedule F lower my self-employment tax. Trading machinery, something we didn't have to deal with before 2018, but those new rules have allowed us to alter our self-employment tax. When you have a higher income level, you quit paying the full amount of the self-employment tax. And for 2023, that's 160,200. You see a year ago, it was 147,000. Well, this is a detrimental effect of inflation because now we're paying the full self-employment tax all the way up to 160,000 instead of only to 147,000. So once you're over that level, you only pay the remaining 2.9% of the 15.3%, and that continues for all income above that level. You only pay 12.4% of the 15.3% up to the 160,000 level. So one way to pay less self-employment tax is bunch income into higher levels. So you quit paying the 12.4% level. You can also convert your farming operation upon retirement 
through a crop share arrangement or a cash rent arrangement as a landlord. And neither of those two arrangements for the landlord portion are subject to self-employment tax when the former farmer is no longer participating in the activity as the operator. Instead, they are merely a landlord. Income averaging is a very unique facet of farm income tax planning. Farmers are the only group who are able to utilize this mathematical tool to lower federal income tax liabilities. It's a three-year look back. So for returns we're filing today for 2022 year, we will look to 21, to 2020, and to 2019. And we'll see if there's any tax brackets unused in those three years that are lower than my current tax bracket in 2022. And this mathematically moves some of my 22 income back, back, back to prior years and allow the farmer to be taxed at a lower rate on some of their 22 income. So here's my quick example. If I had $100,000 available in prior years at 22% tax rates, instead of 37%, my current year rate, then I'd save 15%, or in this example, $15,000 less federal tax by utilizing farm income averaging. So the good news, uh, this is all done by software. It's also done by a specific form the IRS has created to do these calculations, and that form is called Schedule J, and it gathers income from all three prior years plus the current year. All the math is done on this form, and again, only for farmers do they have this chance to look back for three prior years and fill up unused lower tax bracket amounts. One other strategy that farm families are interested in is uh, retirement planning. And especially those farmers who have uh, become established and maybe paid off some initial property acquisition debt, they move forward now and think about their long-term arrangements and think about retirement plans. And even for farmers who are just nearing their operating career, sometimes they then begin to think about retirement plans to continue to defer their income over more years and make sure they have cash coming in over time that's taxed as that cash comes to them. So they have a traditional IRA. You see those amounts that are listed here for their contribution amounts for 2023. They could have a simple IRA, which is one for small business owners, but it gives them a larger amount of contribution up to $15,000. They could have a 401k plan. And for many farm families, they're called solo 401ks because they don't have any other employees than themselves. That number is up to 22,500 as an annual contribution. And you see to the right, uh, if they're age 50 plus, they can have a little larger contribution because of the catch-up provisions that are allowed. I'm over age 50, and so I have a 401k plan that I could contribute $30,000 to uh, for 2023. There are two other plans for self-employed people. Uh, one is called the generally phrased a defined contribution plan. And that means we're gonna define how much money we're gonna put into our plan every year. The maximum amount for that this year, $66,000. And maybe it's only 2,000. You can pick a smaller number if you choose, but the IRS does prescribe what the maximum amount could be. And then my last bullet point, defined benefit plans, also known as cash balance plans. These are especially helpful in a transition plan when a farmer hasn't contributed very much to a retirement plan in prior years, and they want to put a lot of money into a retirement plan in their last few years of operating their business. These defined benefit plans 
Look how big that number is, up to $265,000. That last one takes a lot of actuarial study, a third-party administrator, and some really uh, high-level strategy and legal and policy pieces to get done. So if that's of interest to uh, you or your farm families you serve, uh, make sure they get plenty of expertise on a defined benefit plan. Another key factor for our farm and ranch people is estate taxes. Our current rate is 40%. It had been 45% for several years, but this also dropped in 2018. The exemption levels are the highest they've ever been. Uh, I, for many, many years, in my early career, these exemptions were $600,000 per person. They went to a million, they went to three and a half million, they were at 5 million a decade ago, and now they're up to 12.92 million per person. Couples can share in this. It's a couple's exemption of nearly $26 million. There's a very unique farm valuation method called 2032A, it's a special use valuation. When farmland is used in the business of farming, there's a formula we use to calculate a reduced estate amount and the re maximum reduction you can use to lower federal estate tax is $1.3 million this year. Many farm families in a transition plan to get the next set of young and beginning farmers started thinks about gifting and they can make gifts of up to $17,000 in one year to any one person and not have to report the gift to the IRS and not have to pay any gift tax on that amount. But federal estate taxes have not been a big burden for many farm families. You see less than a half a percent of the estates had a federal estate tax obligation in 2022. Well, we know that's going to grow in 20, i sorry, I said in 2020 is that number. We know that's going to grow in 2022 because the prior slide showed how much our asset values have increased. So I don't expect that to significantly jump, but I certainly expect it to be higher and have more farm families subject to the federal estate tax liability. Well, I mentioned this 2032A as being a unique calculation. So I did a very simple one here to share with you. It starts with the fair rental value of that farm per acre. We then reduce that by the real estate taxes that are paid on similar properties in the neighborhood. We divide that net rental value by an IRS interest rate that they prescribe annually. And that math gives us a value per acre Think of this as a capitalized value, a special use value for the 2032A calculation. And my math that came out at $5,908 an acre. And if the real fair market value by appraisal was $16,000, very common in Illinois the last year, that means the 2032A calculation lowered that value by a little over $10,000 per acre. And I defined on the previous slide, we can't use that to change or lower our, uh, our state value by more than $1.31 million. So that means once I have 130 acres, I've maxed out in my example, the amount of my 2032A reduction. And just to see again, another impact of inflation in the lower right I wrote in 2021, it took 200 acres to maximize that special use value reduction. And this year, only 130 acres because of the higher uh, land value uh, that's uh, caused uh, less acres needed to make that apply. So there are several pre-death and post-death calculations uh, that are requirements that have to be in place to make that work. So again, if your farm families you serve are interested in an alternate calculation for federal or state estate tax computations, 
be sure they use competent professionals to help them through that 2032A calculation. One other important part of estate planning, transition planning for our farm families is stepped up basis. That's a really big thing. I listed four different general assets here and how those are affected by stepped up basis. This is really important to the successors to the farm operator. And so if I think about a transition plan, this is important to who took over these assets that were once owned by the farmer who's now deceased. So they can sell grain inventory, essentially tax-free. They can deduct prepaid expenses again. They can depreciate machinery. They get a new basis in land. They can depreciate improvements again. What does this mean? It means for the successor or the acquirer of this transition plan, they'll have some reduced federal tax obligations for a while that can help them afford to acquire these assets of the career farmer who's now deceased. A very important tax planning piece for farm families uh, that have lots of assets with very low tax basis at the time of their death. So a couple other pieces for 2023, depreciation. My goodness, what a big part of farm tax planning this is today. And there's a, there's a big change that happened in 2023 that demands our attention. We could use 100% bonus depreciation through 2022 meeting. If I buy a tractor that has a cost of $100,000, I can elect my bonus depreciation and deduct that full $100,000 cost in the first year, 2022. That changes in 2023, I can only deduct 80% of that purchase price in 2023, only 60% in 2024, and it works its way down to 0% in a couple of years. So this bonus depreciation has been with us uh, starting in 2018 at this level, and this is the first year we have a little less deduction available for acquiring farm assets. In the blue highlighted sections, uh, we have another thing called the 179 deduction. Uh, this is usually the first choice that farmers make in taking tax deductions. And that's a little over $1.1 million in 23 is the maximum deduction they can use for this depreciation expense. And if they spend more than $2.8 million, then they'll start to lose that deduction because it phases away and is not fully available uh, for a deduction. We note that related party acquisitions don't qualify, meaning if I'm buying from my father, I can't use either of these provisions. If I'm selling to my son, he can't use either of these provisions. Interestingly, uh, my brother is not a related party for this transaction or for this rule. So if I sell my brother a combine, he can use the bonus or 179 deductions because for this very limited scope, we're not deemed to be related parties. And when can you start to use this deduction? This is a phrase, I've coined from a variety of uh, terms, a variety of, a variety of regulations, but I say it's, it has to be in a state of readiness for its intended use. So if on December 27th, I paid for a pickup truck that was going to be built in February of 23, I don't have a 2022 tax deduction. That truck was not ready for its intended use. So I want to mention briefly really this sale of machinery tax trap uh, that exists. Machinery is a very prominent asset on our, for our farm families. It's a big part of any transition plan. It's a big part of a farmer's retirement plan. And they have this machinery asset that they want to convert to cash. And here's the trap. If they do that on an installment sale, meaning Bob sells to Mary, $100,000 of equipment, and she's going to pay me $10,000 a year 
for 10 years plus interest, I have to pay tax on my full sale price in the year of the sale. And in my case, I only received $10,000 of cash that year, but because of the depreciation recapture rule, I have to pay tax on that full sale price in the year of sale, not as I receive that money because of the depreciation rule. Another better idea, maybe Bob's gonna lease that equipment to uh, my buyer, to my successor, instead of selling them all at once. And if we have a solid lease agreement, we'll recognize income as I receive it instead of all at once. Many of our farm families are organized uh, as partnerships. And as a partnership, they have some very unique tax treatments that come to those owners of the partnership. If I sell my interest in my farming partnership, I've sold my underlying assets. I've sold my inventory, I've sold my machinery, I've sold my land that exists there. And I'll go back to the earlier slide where I had asset groups and how they were taxed differently. And I'll look to that to determine my tax obligations from selling my partnership interest. Now the buyer in my transition plan, they have a really unique thing they can do. They can utilize these three different codes I've listed here by the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, and really what those means, what those mean are that the buyer can get more beneficial deductions faster than they could if they were buying a capital asset. So this is a pretty sophisticated level of income tax strategy and preparation. So if this applies, be sure you're getting competent tax advice to help the buyer get their deductions faster and more completely than they would if they fail to utilize these three IRS numeric provisions. And here's a brief example. Our LLC partnership has a $100,000 combine piece of equipment. It's fully depreciated, so my tax basis is zero. My unrelated 25% buyer paid $25,000 for their partnership interest. And because I make this election under 754, 743, 755, they can deduct that $25,000 purchase price in the very first year if they want a deduction that quickly. Differently, if my farm is organized as a corporation, this is a capital asset and the seller has more favorable treatment. They're selling stock. They get to use the lower capital gain tax rates that I showed earlier of zero, 15 or 20%. They can sell that over time and treat that as if they're getting income over time, pay tax over time, collect interest income over time, not be stuck with income all at once like they would if it was just a machinery sale. So good news for the seller, more favorable treatment because of the capital gains applications. Now the buyer, they're not going to like this as well. They've purchased the stock of the corporation. They don't have any depreciation deductions. They have no current year deductions. They don't get to deduct this purchase price until they sell that stock sometime later. So this is much worse for the buyer inside a corporation. The partnership you saw, they can deduct most of that purchase price in one year, but substantially different with the corporate activity. So it's important to note how our farm organizations are structured because the tax treatments, so, so, so different. Well, I mentioned Cubid once before. Let me describe that a little better here. The Qualified Business Income Deduction, it started in 2018, never had it before then. It lets us obtain a 20% deduction if we are in a Qualified Business Income Activity. A Schedule F, a Schedule C, pass-through income from partnerships and S-Corps are going to qualify as business income eligible for this 20% deduction. So what's the deduction that we get without having to write a check? 
and farm clients love those kind of tax deductions. Why? An incentive for businesses to be self-employed, uh, operating a trade or business activity. Now, there are a few things that limit or provide exceptions to QBI in this qualified deduction. Uh, I provided those, but here's the critical piece. Uh, 2025 is the last year this is available, then it expires. Under the current tax rules, this is only with us for 23, 24, and 25. And that's why these lower federal rates are so important in our long-term planning. Now, to what extent might this be amended, modified, redone again? Who knows? That's a legislative process and we'll let others dig into that for us. We can use grain as a tax planning strategy. I've mentioned using gifts of grain. I've mentioned using grain wages that save different types of taxes for our farm families. We can use CCC loans. Uh, that's a way to obtain cash uh, and without taking the income, you can use that as money coming in that doesn't require a grain sale, especially late in the year and lets you manage your tax rates over time. So sometimes those work and sometimes uh, you'd rather actually have the taxable income. If that's the case, you can elect to treat those CCC loans as income when you receive them by a box you check on your Schedule F. You can also def establish these deferred payment contracts, which gives you some flexibility on whether you have income in 2023 or 2022. Uh, there's a variety of ways to utilize deferred payment agreements. Think of these as one type of an installment agreement, and those rules are very flexible in how we treat taxable income uh, from one year to another. We like to keep Schedule F income positive. We try to avoid having lost years in place because there's a certain amount of free tax attributes that everybody gets. They get a standard deduction. Uh, if they have a Schedule F loss, uh, they're not saving any self-employment tax. And it's important then to keep that number above zero if possible to avoid losing some of these important tax deductions. However, if your farm does have negative income, there's an optional self-employment method that you can use for farmers an unlimited number of years to be sure that you pay a little bit of tax and get four full quarters of coverage for disability and retirement through the social security system. I use this very often with our young farm families to be sure that in the unfortunate disability or death of the operating farmer, his survivor and their children were able to have the benefit of disability or survivor's benefits along the way. So think about optional SE if you have a negative schedule F, but want to preserve your acquiring of social security credits. I mentioned income averaging. Uh, this is a great tool when income is higher than anticipated or higher than normal. Use income averaging to push income back to 21, 2020, 2019, and use up those low tax brackets before they're lost and lower your overall tax liability with this, again, farmer-only unique uh, strategy. I wanted to illustrate capital gain rates one layer deeper on this slide. And so I have a land sale uh, at an $18,000 per acre price. The basis was $4,000 an acre, resulting in a capital gain of $14,000 an acre. Then we also have a machinery sale for $150,000. The original cost was $130,000 on this piece of equipment. It's been fully depreciated through bonus or 179 deductions. And so in this case, we have a very unique condition. I don't think I've seen this until 2021, where we actually have a capital gain character on a machinery sale. Always before, ordinary income only, but because of the inflation impact on raising interest rates, 
there are times when we have capital gain on machinery. And he, these are the favorable capital gain tax rates. I mentioned the 0, 15, and 20%. These are the income levels of when those various rates apply. And in my land example, that was $1,120 of gain, there's a $182,000 tax calculated using the more favorable capital gain rates. If this had been a sale of machinery or inventory at an ordinary gain definition, at ordinary tax rates up to 37%, the tax then would have been $334,000. You can see that the capital gain rates, very beneficial to the farmer here. Their tax was about half of what it would have been compared to the ordinary income tax rates. Capital gain is a very favorable tax treatment for our farm families. We have just a few slides left in my presentation. So I wanted to describe uh, sort of, well, what happens now if we get surprised in a tax return and income is higher than we intended it to be? Well, there are other things that happen from higher income we didn't expect. One of those is social security benefits could be taxed at a higher percentage. Generally, social security benefits start at a 0% tax level. They're never taxed at more than 85%. And as income goes up, that 0% climbs up to 85%. Two years from now, your taxpayer could be surprised by having surcharges applied to their Medicare Part B and D premiums. And they're not gonna know that until they get a letter two years later and say, hey, next year, your Medicare premiums are going to be 100 to $600 per month higher. Why? Because your income two years ago was too high. This is sort of a phantom tax that emerges in an unfriendly fashion two years hence. Two additional taxes could apply at higher income levels a net investment tax of 3.8, an additional Medicare tax of 0.9. Generally, these occur when incomes are above 200 or $250,000, depending on your filing status. And as income goes up, your qualified business income deduction could go down because you, at certain income levels, the math changes and if you have too much income, your qualified business income deduction becomes limited. So what about today? It's after the end of the tax year. I'm preparing a return and, oh, income is higher than we thought. Something changed, something surprised us. What can I do today to fix a 2022 tax return? Well, there's several things that might apply. You can defer crop insurance from that you received in 22 to 2023. Now a whole range of restrictions, rules, limitations apply on when this is eligible to be done. But if you meet those requirements, mathematically, you can shove that income to the following year. You can elect out of installment grain sales in 23 that you received back to 22 perhaps, if your 22 income was not as high as you'd like it to be. Again, a whole set of rules on how to make that happen, but it's relatively simple to make that work. If income is too high in 22, this is the time to look at your depreciation schedule. Is it accurate? Have we missed some purchases in any prior year? Have we not calculated depreciation correctly? Because if we've omitted depreciation in a prior year, we can do those calculations and catch that up on the 22 tax return. Income averaging might help. You might look to see if expenses were omitted in their books and records because they didn't write a check for them. Instead, they were paid from a line of credit or vendor financing or a machinery trade that got financed with the dealer financing group. And no checks were written, not in their books and records, but maybe the expense really happened anyway. You still have until after December 31 to make contributions to your health savings accounts, 
to individual retirement accounts, to a self-employed retirement plan, you have a long time after December 31 to fund those deductions today and still make a deduction on your 22 tax return. Itemized deductions are a really important part of calculating tax returns. I mentioned due to a higher standard deduction, maybe less so than ever before, but just want to put a few things here to make sure we can improving the value of these itemized deductions. Donations of grain can help, bunching, putting all of my charitable deductions and state taxes in one year, uh, doubling those up in one year and none in the next year, that might help. If I'm over 70 and I have an IRA, maybe I make my charitable contributions from my IRA. Instead of taking my IRA money to my checking account and me writing a check to the charity, you can do it directly from the IRA. Several of our states in the US have a new thing called pass-through entity tax, where the entity pays the individual state income tax and gets it out of the itemized deduction realm. In Illinois, these were new in 2021, and these have proven to be very helpful in tax strategies for our tax clients. I've mentioned TCJA, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, a couple of times. It started in 2018, and many provisions end after 2025. I've listed these on the screen, and I point these out because we've used these in a very helpful way for our farm families for several years now, uh, but I only have 23, 24, and 25 left to use them, and I don't know what it'll look like after that. Will they be extended, modified, dropped? I don't know, but I know I have a limited time available to use CUBID, the lower tax rates, the increased child tax credit, the higher standard deduction, and for many farm families, a very critical one, the federal estate exemption that goes back to $5 million, not $12 million we have today. And that'll be inflated a bit, but a big change as these provisions expire after 2025. So a lot of cool things are happening this year, uh, but a lot of things to plan for as we uh, think about multi-year tax planning for our farm producers. Sarah, let's go back in and uh, I'm gonna start looking at some of the Q&A items. Do you wanna address some of those uh, here or how do you want yeah. me to Yeah, so there? you got a couple of questions when you were talking about uh, retirement accounts and folks wanted to know if you have an operating loss, can you contribute to retirement accounts and would your contribution be based on gross compensation or net income? That's a very good question. Thank you, Kelly, for submitting that. Uh, the retirement contributions are based on the phrase IRS uses called earned income. So if you have wage income, a positive schedule F, a positive schedule C, you can still make retirement plan contributions even though you have an operating loss. Now, we might say, does that make any sense to contribute to your, to your deductible retirement plan if you have an operating loss? Well, it increases your loss to be used in a later year. But that could be a time where you might consider contributing to a Roth IRA instead of a traditional IRA. But to your question, it's based on earned income, not your final operating loss AGI income. Then I see a question about an entity to set up a solo 401k. Uh, no, Rick, that's a great question. They do not. They can be a sole proprietor, Schedule F filer, and even if they have no employees, they can use that higher 401k amount for their individual contribution, which gets them up to a maximum of $30,000 if they are over age of 50. Now they have to have at least $30,000 of Schedule F profit to do that. So that is the limiting restriction for the amount to contribute. But a solo, a sole proprietor Schedule F fire filer, they can make it happen. We have a question about replacing a roof on a barn in 2022. Can you use 179 bonus or must appreciate? Oh, great question. So 
If this is a barn that's used in production ag for a Schedule F filer, they can use bonus depreciation. They cannot use 179 expensing. A uh, roof barn replacement would be in the definition of 20 year property. And you could only use 179 expensing up to what we call 15 year property equipment and improvements to farmland. But it is eligible for a bonus deduction. Is it only grain and not hay uh, for some of these gifts? Uh, no, that's, that's a good clarification. It would be any raised products on your farm. So corn, soybeans, wheat, hay, any type of raised product would qualify for the payment in kind or gifts to charity. Income tax issues on livestock and dairy farming. Uh, well, you've listed the first one in your example, uh, breeding livestock. This is a great uh, tax saver. If I have raised breeding stock, it's capital gain eligible. I get zero, 15 or 20%, not ordinary tax rates. If it's raised breeding stock that gets the capital gain rate applied, here's the downside. It is not eligible for the qualified business income deduction, but that's okay. I'm only paying zero or 15% tax on it anyway. Many of our dairy farm operations are part of dairy co-ops and they receive large uh, domestic production activity deductions from those dairy co-ops. And those are still large uh, deductions for farm families to use. Uh, is there a recording available? Sarah, I'll let you take that one. Let me go back to uh, Michael's question, receiving a large amount of money for selling farm development rights. Other than income averaging, what other things can I do to reduce taxes? Well, I'm glad you raised this, uh, Michael, because this is one important part about income averaging. You can't use it when you're selling farmland capital gain income. Can't use Schedule J income averaging on land sales. You can on inventory, you can on machinery, you can on partnership related farm income, but not on selling uh, a capital asset for farmland. So what else can you do? Uh, we worked on one of these earlier this fall on a very similar situation. And we found very limited opportunities of what we could do. So this producer that I'm describing uh, built a confinement facility to continue his operation. So we could use the 179 deduction against that a $400,000 building construction. Uh, that was fine. Uh, he had other wage income, so he could fund a 401k through his work. He could fund an IRA through his wife's uh, activities. Small numbers, though, probably compared to a large capital gain asset. But sometimes investing this money in depreciable assets is the biggest bang we can get to lower the tax impact in situations with large capital gains. You know, you might have some assets that are capital losses. Maybe you have a stock fund that's lost 30% uh, in a year. You can sell those stocks at a loss, offset part of your land income. Maybe that fits, but it's very difficult to uh, go through uh, a large capital gain and offset that with other deductions. The good news, a very favorable tax rates. Uh, is same for the roof example, renovate an uninsulated machine storage shed. Uh, yes, uh, bonus depreciation, that machine storage shed would be a 20 year property, also eligible for bonus depreciation. I would also watch out in Illinois, we can't use bonus depreciation here. So we'd get a good federal deduction, but a very limited state tax deduction, one other key planning point. Uh, can you switch a truck from personal to farm vehicle as a beginning farmer? Uh, yes, uh, you can do that. Uh, you would determine uh, what your basis in that truck is and start depreciating that just as if you placed it into service in your farm operation at the point in time you started using it and you can start making that, uh, start making that deduction then. Michael's clarifying just the development rights 
Uh, I think it's the same answer. We still have capital gain property. Uh, it's not going to be a tangible asset eligible for capital gain. Uh, can you use income averaging on a timber sale? Uh, Boyce, that's a great question. My first answer is no, I don't think so because it's going to be a capital gain asset and it's not one that's used in your trade or business. Now, if you are a timber developer, I might give you a different answer to that question. But if you're just cutting timber, standing trees, harvesting that periodically on your farm, that's the normal condition in Illinois. Uh, we would say it's a capital gain asset, but not eligible for income averaging. But you know, that's one I'd like to read up a little more on. And my first answer is uh, no. Uh, receiving a grant to build a barn and make improvements. You get a 1099G and it's taxable. Yes, that's right, it is. Can I deduct the expenses for the barn construction or do I have to depreciate the barn and pay taxes? Well, I think your choices are, uh, this is what I would do. I would have my 1099G amount, my grant as income on my Schedule F, and then I would depreciate my barn through bonus depreciation and claim that deduction. They should perhaps offset each other to an exact or similar degree. Uh, there is also an option on certain NRCS grants to treat those as uh, deferred amounts and not count those as income and likewise not deduct your expenses. And that might be what you would want to do on your pasture improvements. You know, I'll give a plug here for the IRS Pub 225, the Farmer's Tax Guide. I know there's an example in that publication exactly on this question. Uh, if the economy is going down, may one transfer their Roth uh, 401k after sale investments and reinvest in a Roth at a bank? Um, so if you have a Roth, um, and you're going to reinvest at a bank. To me, that looks like from one Roth to the other. I might not be understanding that question precisely, but again, your Roth has not ever been deducted. And so by you know, liquidating a Roth account, you're not gonna have any tax liability from that. It looks to me like in that case, you're just transferring from one trustee to the other. Can you depreciate an auto full amount? No. There are limited amounts for uh, automobiles that can be used in the bonus depreciation category. Off the top of my head, I'm going to say that's an $8,600-ish uh, annual limitation. Can you do a like-kind exchange and buy land with the income from the sale of development rights? Oh, gosh. I'm going to say probably yes, but that would have had to have been done, you know, at the time of the sale. There are very strict requirements on like-kind exchanges. If the taxpayer received the money, too late to do a like-kind exchange. But if they haven't received the money, then look into the provisions of Internal Revenue Code Section 1031 and see if you can do a like-kind exchange. But again, very explicit timing requirements. If you sold cows a big loss due to drought and they've been depreciated, the amount will just have to be taken as income. Well, to the extent of the depreciation amount. So uh, yes, I think you'll have depreciation uh, recapture that would occur, but there are also rules uh, when there is drought on uh, deferring the income from those sales uh, over other years. So there's a whole section, again, in the IRS Pub 225 Farmer's Tax Guide on dealing with livestock sales in distressed uh, weather conditions. Uh, purchased a home with two rental homes, put a new farm in its own LLC, and you have a farm LLC, rent the land from the new as well as your home personal farm operating um, yeah, you can do all types of those things. You know, those there are legal issues there. There are liability protection issues there. So we have to get down to what's the final tax treatment of that. 
And some of that depends on how actively engaged the producer is in those two different rental activities. Often if you're renting from yourself, IRS will recognize that as rental income, but still subject to a self-employment tax. Uh, Sarah, I think I'm to the end of those. We're at about 310. Um, we probably ought to uh, take me off the screen and get people onto the rest of their day, Sarah. So come back on and I'll kind of look through uh, more questions as you're giving our close and see if there's something else I should add. No, um, just a couple of closing comments for folks. We got a lot of questions about whether or not there's going to be a recording. Um, this was being recorded. Well, once we finish captioning, just as a reminder, we will email everybody the link and it will be posted on our farmers.gov YouTube playlist where all of our ag tax webinars are. So, um, and I know this one, this webinar was focused on kind of your tax strategy and, you know, handling your the taxation of your assets or maybe transferring from the next generation and kind of you know how to reduce your overall tax burden if you're a beginning farmer who's maybe not in the situation where you have a lot of those assets or you know you're operating at a loss we do have other webinars and materials too on our website um, including stuff on how to find a tax preparer and some of those more introductory topics so folks you know um, if some of this was Maybe you're not there yet, but it's good for forecasting and planning. Make sure you check out our other materials and we're gonna post Bob's presentation as well as a PDF of the slide deck online. And we'll email everybody once those are live. So thank you all for joining today and have a great rest of the week. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate everybody joining us. Bye.